But it's my pleasure to introduce Eugene Jarecki. He's a documentary filmmaker of the film The House I Live In, which will be screened tonight at the Crest Theater at 5.30, and all members and staff, of course, are invited to attend. Mr. Jarecki is a senior visiting fellow at Brown University's Watson Institute for International Studies and the founder and executive director of the Eisenhower Project, an academic public policy group dedicated in the spirit of Dwight D. Eisenhower to studying the forces which shape American foreign policy. Today we have the privilege, and those uh, watching on California uh, cable, have the chance to hear Mr. Jarecki talk about his newest film, which again will be previewed tonight or screened tonight at the Crest Theater. It's The War on Drugs. And this is a film that certainly is not without some controversy. What what that is important in this state or in this country, in this world, uh, is not without controversy. It is my hope, however, that the presentation will increase our understanding of the factual toll in blood and treasure of the so-called war. And I would note that as Mr. Jarecki makes his presentation, that this hasn't boiled down to the usual partisan, along the usual partisan fault lines. That People as diverse as New Jersey Governor Chris Christie and former Secretary of State James Baker as well as a number of leaders on the opposite side of, of politics have spoken out about what we do and what we might do differently when it comes to how we deal with drugs. Regardless of your point of view, uh, we welcome Mr. Jarecki and look forward to his remarks and what I hope is the beginning, not only today, but throughout the course of the year and the session on a very important dialogue. Please welcome Eugene Jarecki. Thank you. Thank you all very, very much. It's a great honor to be here today. Uh, Senators, I was, uh, when I uh, came into the room, everybody was uh, hosting the Dodgers moment, and uh, that, that uh, gave me a holiday in my heart in a way, because I got to see how well you all get along, and I'm sure that's the kind of issue you have every day that brings everybody together and is uh, heartwarming for all of you, and I'm sure I would find the same at the House. Um, can you hear me? They tell me it was very sensitive. Can people hear me better now? Okay, good. So it was very nice to be able to come in and see you all on such a collegial issue as uh, baseball, which we can all agree on, and I'm sure there are always issues that can divide us, but I have the great fortune today of uh, coming before you to talk about an issue on which there is actually a great deal of growing agreement in this country across party lines. And uh, the reason for that, I think, is that we're at a different time in the history of the war on drugs than we've ever been before. Um, as it was mentioned um, by Pro Tem, you know, you really are at a position now where some of the leading voices against the drug war come from sort of the right on crime part of the scenario, who look at the drug war as a bloated federal program, a disaster. We have spent a trillion dollars over 40 years. We've had 45 million drug arrests. And we have nothing to show for it, sadly, except a record of abject failure. Drugs are cheaper, purer, more available than ever before. They're in use by younger and younger people than ever before. And all we've done in the process, really, is to have created a prison system that makes us the world's leading jailer, with 2.3 million of our citizens behind bars, more than any other country in the world. So for me, it's extremely inspiring these days to be talking about a subject where I hear from the right a great deal of concern about the incredible waste of this, the incredible loss of treasure, money that could be better spent making us more competitive in the world making our young people live the lives we want for them, rather than the kind of loss that we see, the kind of shattered communities, a prison industrial system that creates jobs, sadly, out of the incarceration of fellow human beings. And so the idea of hearing voices like Grover Norquist, like James Baker, like George Schultz, hearing voices like that when, for example, you know, you saw legislation come on election day in this state, Prop 36 passed, and really was a symbol to the nation. And what's exciting about that to be here in California is that the nation has a problem. It has a drug problem. It's an extremely severe problem. We have the highest levels of demand on earth. And all of that draconian lawmaking has done nothing to curb the demand. 
And so we continue to have those unchecked, unprecedented, unmatched levels of demand. And that's the nation's problem, and it needs to be met with science, with wisdom, with compassion, with Christian compassion and the belief in redemption. And instead, of course, we've been on a track of runaway punitive measures, and they haven't added up. They haven't added up to make the world better. They haven't added up to make our streets safer. Pew Research teaches us something extraordinary. Pew Research did studies that showed, and these have been borne out year after year in the past decades, that any society that incarcerates, say, 300 people per 100,000, at 300 people per 100,000, they see a strong deterrent to crime, where the amount of arresting and incarcerating you're doing is actually diminishing crime. It's acting like the deterrent you want. As you climb above that towards, say, 500 per 100,000, they see it regress. They now see that you're fostering more crime than you're reducing. Because what's happening? You're criminalizing very often young people. You're sending them into a place where they get a strike on their record at 13 or 14 years of age, a strike they can never erase, and it prevents them from being able to enter the mainstream economy and show the personal responsibility we want them to show. And so what happens then? They get lured into, very easily by drug dealers and by others, into an underground economy. And probably along the way, like any young person, they make the same mistakes that people make. And so they might try a drug here or there. And in the trying of that drug, they might develop an addiction, and we have nothing to do for them other than to give them a strike on their record that worsens it. And so as we see in the Pew Research study, when you climb up toward 500, you're now creating more criminality than you're solving because you might send them to jail where they'll learn from hardened criminals how to be the criminal they weren't when you arrested them. They were just dabbling. Now they learn how to really do it on the street. And so at 500, you start to see this negative consequence. America incarcerates 740 people per 100,000. We are way past Pew's danger zone for how you become dysfunctional in dealing with crime. In 10 inner cities in America, among African Americans, the rate is 4,000 per 100,000, which tells the story, I think, not only about the tragedy that's befallen our poorer communities in this country under the drug war, where things have not gotten better, we have not solved the drug problem, we have just shattered lives, destroyed families, and undermined communities, but it tells you something else, and this is why we find ourselves with such a new measure of agreement, because it turns out that being tough on crime in that way actually doesn't make the communities safer. That's what 4,000 per 100,000 tells you. It tells you that when we're toughest on crime, we are actually working backward and making more crime, making our communities less safe, which means that for members who are concerned about crime and the safety of their communities, there is a new lesson in the wind, and Grover Norquist will teach it to us because he looks at it from the numbers, and Pat Robertson looks at it from an ecumenical perspective, also an opponent of what we're doing with our drug laws. And Chris Christie looks at it looking over a state like New Jersey with such severe drug crisis going on and yet with such an unproductive approach to it through the war on drugs. What they all teach us is that there's new common ground between Democrats and Republicans, Democrats who may have for years been saying, I think this is inhumane, it seems unjust, it's dissonant with our principles that we talk to our constituents about, but now Republicans who say, what an extraordinarily bloated, dysfunctional federal program and increasingly state programs that is not making our communities safer and we can't afford it. And part of the inspirational thing about being here today is that the country's got a problem, but in many ways as a visitor to California, California has a solution. California is operating in a way that the nation is watching. And California has set in the past few months, let alone, on election day, let alone, an extraordinary mark for other states to try to emulate because California set on election day when District Attorney Cooley stepped forward and supported Prop 36 when voice after voice from the right and the left supported the passage of Prop 36, what California was saying to the country was, and I say this as somebody who's watching this and observing, I've been in 25 states making my film for several years now, I've been in 45 states traveling with the film this year, and California is the state they're all watching because it showed on election day with Prop 36 that you could make greater justice, smarter law enforcement, because you are not wasting money on incarcerating the nonviolent for sentences longer than the violent, distracting yourselves with the nonviolent when your real focus in a country where we have a violence issue needs to be the violent. You can do all that intelligent and humane stuff, and you can save the state $100 million a year. 
States across the country want to save $100 million a year by modifying one law here or there. And every political figure who has a constituency wants to be able to say, I'm behind the savings of that kind of money because we need to save that kind of money. And what better way than to give our children greater chances and give the nonviolent the kind of consideration that distinguishes them from the violent. Because in this country, prior, for example, to Election Day, California had the problem of leading the nation in saying, we are going to treat the nonviolent as though they were violent. Which actually, if you're a young person being a nonviolent person, and you get a sentence as if you're a violent person, well, no wonder you start thinking that violence is okay. You've been told that that's what you are anyway. We're giving young people no incentive to stay on the course of nonviolence. And so I come here today on an issue that I believe has tremendous comfort and safety for members across the spectrum to be able to advocate that we move away from the blind, tough-on-crime rhetoric of our past, which is understandable why it happened. My film, which is showing tonight, and I hope people watch it, making it taught me a great deal about how we went so wrong. I wondered the whole time, how did we get here? And let me stop for a moment and tell you why it happened to me. Because I may not look like the usual candidate uh, uh, who is a target of our drug laws, right? I'm a comfortable white person. I've never been touched by a drug law in my life. I'm not a drug user, but if I were one, chances are I also would never see the business end of law enforcement because all too often our drug laws have had the impact that the way we enforce them, the way the laws are written, the way poverty plays a role, and the way our sentencing happens has had an extraordinarily disproportionate impact on minorities and poor communities. Take New York, for example. In New York, the NYPD, where I'm from, we stop 700,000 people a year in New York. That's one person every 45 seconds. So I'm going to raise my hand because somebody is getting stopped right now, and I'll raise it again in 45 seconds. And in the intervening time, I'll tell you that of those 700,000 people that we stop, 87% are young blacks and Latinos. Black people, for example, are 14% of the country. Growing up, I always thought that crack, as a good example, was a black drug. In making the movie, I learned that isn't true. The majority of crack users in America are, and always have been, white. You wouldn't know that from the mainstream media, and you wouldn't know it to see who gets stopped on the streets of New York. Because 14% of crack users are black, and yet 90% of those being stopped on the streets of New York in stops are African American and Latino. Now you look within that group at who gets frisked. That's half. So now you're at 350,000 stop and frisks a year. We just had another stop. So in that 350,000 stop and frisks a year, it turns out only 10% of the time do they find anything that leads to an arrest. In the other 90% of cases, the police just say, you can go now. After you've humiliated a young person in front of their community, denigrated them in front of their church, their school, their housing project, their family, and then we say to these young people, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Show some personal responsibility while we kneecap you every 45 seconds. And the problem is, is that that structure leads young people to feel alienated from society, to feel they don't have a chance to distrust authority. So it's bad for the spirit of the community. But talk to the cops, as I did, and they'll tell you it's bad for law enforcement. It's not smart on crime. Why? Because the number one thing in any policeman's arsenal is what? Information. You need to cultivate information on the ground in a neighborhood if you want to keep the neighborhood safe. You need to know who's doing what. When you're stopping and frisking half the people you see in one every 45 seconds and alienating the community that 90% of the time you're just harassing them, they're not going to want to give you information. They're not going to see you as a potential colleague. They're going to increasingly feel distant from you, and you're going to become less able to stop violent crime, to deal with serious crime as you need information to do. So what brought me to this was that I became very concerned growing up in America that my life was becoming very different from the lives of African-American people, for example, that I saw. Now, why did this even matter to me? I'll pause for a moment to say that today is Holocaust Remembrance Day. This means a great deal to me personally. My father fled Nazi Germany in 1939. His family came to America, as my mother's family had come as well. My mother's family fled persecution in Russia at the turn of the 20th century. And the young people in my family were taught that our mission in life 
here in America, in this newly adopted country that gave us shelter, was to speak out for any moment when we see groups being treated without dignity, without regard for human rights. And so my life has been sort of naturally devoted to social justice because it's where I came from. And because my family, like many Jewish families that came to America, saw it as a calling to speak out for those who are voiceless, who need their dignity recognized. Well, how this led me to the war on drugs is that, like many comfortable white kids, I had a housekeeper growing up. And my housekeeper was named Nanny Jetter. She's now one of the dearest friends I have in the world. And if you get to see the film tonight, you'll see her story told, because my film, in one way, is sort of a love letter to her. But it's a very sad love letter, because the movie really took shape in my mind in a conversation I had with her. Nanny's family had been ravaged, not only by drugs, but then by the war we waged against them, as if insult to injury that what she really needed was her family to see a kind of mental health system in place that would deal with drug addiction as the health matter it is. And instead, she saw her family time and again get brutalized by law enforcement, not with any ill will from cops, just policies that weren't based in a belief in human dignity and redemption, but instead were punitive. And so Nanny came to me at one point, and we were talking about the pain that her family had gone through, both from drugs and the war on drugs. And she said something to me that was totally heartbreaking. Remember, this is a lady who took care of me and cleaned up after the mess that my brothers and I would make on the floor and for years and years toiled and, 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 and struggled to make good for us and, of course, to make good for her kids back home. And, you know, what's the old thing? We always, all of us who come from immigrant roots and all of us who believe in the American dream, we always hear the same beautiful refrain from the American story, which is, I work and I work my fingers to the bone so that my kids will have it better than I do, so that they will advance, and I'll do the work to get them there. The crazy and heartbreaking thing about my conversation with Nanny that day was that she looked at me with an incredible amount of sadness, and she said it felt to her after all the decades of work, and she wasn't guilting me in the slightest, it was just a reflection, that after all that time, all that effort, that she felt like she was the first generation of black Americans who were better off than their children that that slow, steady, hardworking climb that is so much a part of the American dream had turned south on her watch. And it filled me with such pain and empathy and outrage. And that led to the making of a film that said, well, what is it that happened to young black Americans during my upbringing? I grew up in the wake of the Civil Rights Movement when I thought things were going to get much better for black Americans. And it's true. Today, we have a black president. We have African Americans who make an extraordinary contribution to American life, both in political leadership positions and corporate positions, in Hollywood and in business, all over the map. But it is also true that we cannot kid ourselves. For the masses of black people, the leading indicators for decades, economic, political, and social, have been grim. When I was growing up, we heard all the statistics about the number of black men in jail as compared to the number who would go to college. I kept hearing these statistics about the extraordinary shattering of black American families. I kept hearing that black people used crack. I thought it was all about black people using crack. I didn't know that something far more complex was at work. And so I started to ask people as a researcher, what is going on? What is obstructing African American progress in this country? And the answer kept coming back inadequate, like, oh, they're going off to jail all the time. Well, how can, you, how can you progress if you're going off to jail all the time? But that didn't answer why were people being taken off to jail. And the harder I looked, the more clear it became that the war on drugs was declared in 1971 by Richard Nixon, and we have seen a 700% increase in our national prison population since that time. 700% increase in the time of the war on drugs. And so that was not a coincidence, and it required that I research it. And so I made this film, The House I Live In, which tried to understand how did we get here? How did we come to be gripped by a war on drugs that has cost so much and achieved nothing but despair? And how does it function today politically? How much does it have policy making in its grip? How much has it become a kind of self-perpetuating monster? that has both parties in its grasp and unfortunately has us not operating from the better angels in our nature, not operating from common sense, not operating from science and medicine, and not solving the problem. And so when I started to ask those questions, 
I wanted to get out around the country to talk to people. I went to 25 states. I talked to drug dealers, to family members, to cops. I traveled in their patrol cars, watched them as they did drug arrest after drug arrest and got inside their thinking on what they're doing. I went into jails across the country and met with jailers and wardens. I went to see judges and lawyers and prosecutors to try to take a full profile of all the people involved in this system. And I have to tell you that as I embarked on this journey, I think I thought, well, we have a really unjust system on our hands. Nobody quite knows how to fix it. None of us want it to be this way, but it kind of got out of control, and it's just this big, bad monster. And I guess I thought, like everyday people do, because the television feeds this impression as well, that all the prison guards are like tough, on, tough as nails, lock them up and throw away the key kind of people. And the cops just want to hammer people onto the hood of their car and treat them badly. I had all those mythologies floating through my head because they're in all the movies. And the judges are like, guilty, guilty, guilty. Well, it turns out that when I tried to find these people in real life, they don't exist. What you meet are textured, hardworking Americans who are themselves victims of this system. The cops told me from the front seat of their patrol car in Providence, Rhode Island, in Miami, in New Mexico, in California, in Vermont, in New York, police after police would sit in the front seat of their patrol car and tell me, I am here and week after week, I am arresting the same people. They are rotating through this system. They are not getting better and I am not improving public safety, but this is what it became. One officer in particular, I actually got footage of him. He'd been on the TV show Cops. He's a Providence cop, and I saw him when he was a young, strapping cop. He'd want me to say he's still a kind of a little bit less young, but still strapping cop. But today, he's weary. It's not what he thought it was going to be. And to hear him reflect on a sense of purposelessness to what it's all become was so captivating. But it was echoed when I went to talk to a federal judge and several other federal judges who over and over told me, the mandatory minimums passed by Congress tie my hands. They make it so that I don't have discretion over the sentences that I'm giving out. To give you an example, a judge said to me, astonishingly, he said, you know, there's a kid in here today that you're going to watch his case. He said, he's facing a sentence for five grams of crack cocaine. He said, the sentence he's facing, I can't do anything about it. If I found out that he had won the Congressional Medal of Honor yesterday, I couldn't give him a different sentence. If he'd pulled a grandmother from a burning building, I couldn't give him a lesser sentence today. He said, how can that make any sense? Why am I here, said the judge. He said, but equally ludicrous is that if the kid was in here for 4.9 grams, he'd be walking today. How can 0.1 gram be the difference in justice? That's painting with too broad a brush. So then the judges from their chambers courageously told me what was wrong with the war on drugs. And that brought me then to the prisons. And in prisons, I found jailers who I thought were the lock them up and throw away the key type. They, they seemed like they were straight out of central casting for a movie like mine. But as soon as I started talking to them, they all told me the same thing. We're here on the inside of corrections. We want it to be corrections. We want to be the thing that makes it so that the people who come in here come out and are able to go back into society better than they got here. Because we want to give them chances they probably didn't have on the outside. We need programs to teach them air conditioning repair or carpentry or heat. We want to teach them skills and also faith and character programs that would give them sort of gifts and ideas in their minds that they wouldn't have gotten another way. He said, but the problem is politicians run on tough on crime rhetoric because they're scared of appearing soft on crime, so they promise more cops on the beat, more overtime, more handcuffs, all that tough stuff. And it sounds good, scares people, gets them elected, it's an old way of doing things. It's worked for a while. He said, but then the problem is we get flooded with all these new bodies from all those new arrests. Where do they get the money to pay for all that stuff they promised? All of a sudden, we watch our budgets getting cut and slashed because money's needed. So all of a sudden, we don't have those programs anymore. I went to a prison and watched them with an air conditioning repair program. When I came back six months later, the doors were shut. No more air conditioning repair. No more teaching that skill that might give someone a chance when they get out. And so what, he, what prison security chief and guard said to me over and over was, we are here on the inside and we see this losing game because we watch the same people rotate through here and they get out not better than when they came in. And this recidivism that is such becoming almost an American phenomenon is something that must stop. And when you start to hear that from insiders, 
It's so captivating, and it brings us to where I am today, which is I believe that there is a brand new level of movement. If you look on the internet right now and you look at the kind of press that is coming out about the increasing wave from right and left of rethinking the war on drugs, you see that California is poised to really lead the country and bring us back from the brink of being overly tough on crime, which as Pew teaches us, can actually make us less safe and waste a huge amount of money and it can bring us back to being smart on crime. And I'm happy to take questions and talk about what I think smart on crime really looks like, because of course, the solutions is where it's hardest. And I have a lot of thoughts about that that I'd love to discuss with anybody who, who would like to make comments or have questions. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about how I got here, but I think I've said enough just to start the conversation going, which I think is half the battle. The way we'll do this now is uh, ask members to put up their mic and uh, we'll try to have an informal conversation. Ronald, we'll begin with Senator Leno. Uh, first of all, thank you, Pro Tem Steinberg, for bringing Mr. Drecke to our chambers. And thank you, sir, for your intelligent, articulate, impassioned presentation, which for those of my colleagues who have not yet seen your film, I had the pleasure of being with you in San Francisco for a briefing uh, some months ago, uh, matches your presentation but makes it all the more powerful because of the visual. And I agree with you that it is fascinating to see this meeting of left and right at the political spectrum come together, potentially for different reasons, but recognizing that the agreement here is that what we're doing is not working. And it's costing us money we cannot afford and it's costing us human lives we cannot afford. It gets even more complex when we try to do something about it legislatively. And I enjoyed following your comments with regard to the judge's response and the police officer's response and the jailer's response. You know, if those politicians didn't pass these tough on crime bills, sure. we wouldn't be caught in this situation. Sure. So then, of course, it falls back to us. We're the policymakers. But then when we put reforms before the legislative bodies, of course, the very voices that we as elected officials turn to for counsel and advice are the same people you've just mentioned who are putting the blame on us when we don't get their support when we try to make the change. Sure. So what I'm leading to, uh, actually, you know, Data and figures sometimes help, sometimes not. I'm looking at a most recent communication in my office. In fact, it's addressed to California legislative leaders, so it's, I'm sure all of my colleagues got one, from Right on Crime. And with regard to states that charge simple possession of a drug as a misdemeanor rather than a felony, yes. they point to a Maryland study and quote it in this letter that says that Low risk, meaning nonviolent, non serious, non sex offender, substance abuse offenders that were directed into evidence based probation and treatment programs were 22% likely to recidivate, 22% less likely to commit another crime than those charged with the same crime of drug possession, right. sent to a penitentiary and sit there for years right. and years and years without any programs, right. as you say, because they've been cut, because we don't have any programming. So the challenge is, and I wanted to ask, in the film, I remember a segment where you interviewed some law enforcement officers. And what, if I remember correctly, the film was communicating is that there is an insidious incentive Yes for the status quo among sure. rank and file officers. Yep. And so we need law enforcement to join us in this because too many of us just don't want to cross our local law enforcement folks, yep. uh, both for policy and political reasons. But if you could share with us what sure. you learned about this in, in incentive that yep. supports the status quo. Well, you're asking a crucial question and it goes to compassion. Coming in here today, I have the same compassion for senators in this chamber that I cultivate for prison guards, that I cultivate for law enforcement officers, that I find for judges. 
because all of us are trapped in a system that none of us designed. And the question is, where do you go from here? And there's no question that it is difficult to navigate that touchy space between being smart on crime and being tough on crime, because the effort to cross over can sound risky toward those constituencies you just talked about who blame you and then in private counsel with you say, please don't pull this thing back. Well, the reality is we are headed for a revolutionary change of this system. You can see it because it's not affordable anymore. The disaster of it is so clear and has become so unmitigatedly clear that there's very few people who will advocate this in public. It used to be, for example, in a presidential election like we just had, that crime was a major issue and sounding tough on crime was the way to get elected. Increasingly, we see the studies tell us that it doesn't resonate terribly heavily with the public. Neither presidential candidate mentioned crime on the campaign trail. That's part of a trend. We saw this week alone that Pew Research again did a study that marijuana legalization is supported by a majority of Americans. Now, why do I care about that? I don't take marijuana. But what I care about about that legalization is marijuana legalization in Colorado that happened, in Washington that happened, this means less injustice. It also means less wasted expenditure. So I come in here today saying there is a way, and I'll get to the question about my understanding of the police that grip the cop finds himself in, but it's simply a sibling of the grip that a senator finds himself in. So let's go to the policeman. David Simon, who created the television show The Wire, is in my film, and he's a police reporter, has a very intimate knowledge of cops. And as I traveled with the cops, we also intercut with some of Simon's thoughts about what position the cops find themselves in. Well, a police officer increasingly today finds that the incentives lie in racking up cheap, easy, petty drug arrests, where you jack somebody up against the side of a liquor store to find something that they couldn't get from a doctor in their pocket, and that's considered a contribution to public safety. Now, he says, that's Officer A, and he might get 40, 50, 60 of those arrests a month. He says, now you go over to Officer B, and Officer B thinks, you know what? That's not what I thought police work was going to be. I want to solve serious stuff like rapes, robberies, murders, things people are really concerned about and should be. He says, you know that rape over on 3rd Street? I wonder if that's related to that other thing, that, that, that other sort of harassment thing that happened over on 5th Street. I'm going to work that. I'm going to go talk to my informants who I haven't freaked out by patting them down every 10 minutes. I'm going to go find my informants. I'm going to figure out whether those are connected. I'm going to be a cop. He says, well, that guy, if he's lucky, he might get one arrest that month. Meaningful arrest, but it's one. The other guy, every time he's making those petty drug arrests and bringing them down to headquarters and filing those, he's getting overtime for that. He says to a point where overtime can make up about half of that policeman's salary. So the incentive is so deeply in that. But then it gets worse because come to the end of the month and they want to do the job reviews, they say, Officer A, he had 50, 60 arrests. Officer B had one arrest. Who do you think they make the sergeant? And so we've put our police officers, due to the way our laws incentivize it, grant programs and also just the nature of our slanted court system, so the prosecutional power adds to this, we've put them in a position where they are incentivized to do a kind of law enforcement that when they are older and have been there a while and their hot blood has, has cooled a bit, they start to realize, I'm not really making this town safer. And that's what cop after cop told me with extraordinary poignant testimony. And so I come here today saying if they can courageously from the front seat of their patrol car go in a movie that will be on national television tonight seen by millions of people over and over for posterity and say please reform this, please help me. I understand that's not the voice you're getting in private but the voice you're getting in private is not the, is not the better angels in our nature. The better angels in our nature is the courage of any of the victims of this system, and we all are, to stand up and say there is a time for courage to lead us to be smart on crime rather than cowardice and short-sightedness to make us simply blindly tough on crime. Shamelessly plug the film one more time. If you or your staff or any one of our colleagues who are not here right now but I'll plug it listening. tonight at the Crest Theater. <laughs> what time is it at tonight? Uh, I think the film will start around 6. There's a reception at 5.30. Reception at 5.30? Panel discussion Great. about 7 or 7.15 afterward with okay. you. Uh, it's really worth seeing. And hopefully, in a bipartisan fashion, uh, I will be joining forces with many of you to try and change some of the very problems we've been talking about today so we can get to the common goal, which we all have, yep. safer communities. Yep.
Ricky, uh, maybe we could end uh, a little bit on this note. First of all, thank you. Um, and, and for me to state, um, m my bias is towards your point of view. I think the war on drugs has been a, a failure, but let, let us end with a bit of a challenge here too, and let me state a pejorative and, and get your response, because I think for a lot of colleagues who uh, agree that what is, what goes on now is a poor expense of public resources and oftentimes inhumane and unfair, they also then ask, well then, what is the solution given this pejorative? Yep. Drugs are bad. Yep. Illegal drugs are bad. Marijuana, to use, I know too many friends of mine from high school who messed up their heads and their lives because they smoke too much marijuana. Drugs, the abuse of drugs can lead and does oftentimes lead to ruined lives. Mm -hmm. So how do we, how do you, how do we appeal to <clears throat> that part of the reality sure. uh, and real life experience as well for people so that this isn't a polarizing, yep. you're either, the, you're either the left or, 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 or you see it from a strict law enforcement side. Help us figure out our way through that thicket in, in about 120 seconds. Okay, Maybe. I'll do my best. And then I think, we'll it's, I think this it. is another real common cause area. We've noticed recently in the shooting in Newtown uh, that is such a tragedy, but it's a tragedy that it's ignited a gun debate, but it also should have ignited the real debate, which is about our lack of a mental health system in this country because it is far too late to stop a crisis from happening at the school door. You need to be having mental health services that find in young people as they're getting older, uh, that finds the kind of, of mental instability that can lead to that kind of outcome. Now, I raise the mental health issue because it's related to the drug issue. Drugs are a public health matter. It was a mistake, an accident of history, that we ever dealt with them as a crime in the first place. Now, that may seem like a massive rethink, but I would urge you to remember that we once went through this with prohibition, and it was a massive rethink to decide that that was a disaster. Prohibition was a fraction the disaster, economically and in human cost, that the war on drugs is. And so why did we repeat history? Why is it that alcohol, whose track record of destruction to human health and public safety, dwarfs all of the drugs on the schedule of illegal drugs in this country? There is no comparison. Why do we treat it far more leniently and sanely than we do drugs? Why don't we simply, as a government, take a responsible public health role to tax and regulate drugs? If you tax and regulate them, you will take the market out of them, the violence will go away, and you will be left to be able to control them as we do alcohol. Alcohol is a controlled substance. Children cannot be sold it. Grown-ups have to use it responsibly. And if you go out and kill someone with your car, it'll be manslaughter. If you were drinking, it'll be an aggravating offense. And so. First of all, I don't know how we got off on this bender of repeating prohibition. Second of all, I will use my last moments to point everyone toward the country of Portugal. I know Americans, we all hate hearing that it's being done some other country better, whatever, it usually was Norway. Let's, we don't care what the Norwegians are doing, but I care what they're doing in Portugal. Because 12 years ago, Portugal had a horrifying national drug problem, as we do, an incredible grip on public health. And what did they do? Radical idea, they decriminalized possession personal possession of all drugs across the board. At higher levels where you're in possession of real quantities where you're a dealer, serious penalties remain. But when they decriminalized across the board in that way, every leading indicator was a stunning success. Drug use rates in Portugal are way down. HIV rates, way down. Violence, way down. The work toll on the criminal justice system also is way down, and that drop in the workload has been a huge economic savings for Portugal, and just a portion of it, a fraction, has been spent by Portugal to make one of the most robust and innovative treatment systems in the world whose results we're all seeing. So America is long overdue to create an enormous number of new jobs in a revitalized mental health system that would, on one hand, stop people from becoming mounting violent threats, as we are unfortunately seeing them do, and on the other hand, would provide addiction services to people who need them so that we stop putting the nonviolent in jail. We don't need armed people at school doors and we do not need nonviolent people in prison. Stay tuned, Mr. Jarecki, because we may have another film for you to make 
when we get done working on mental health this year, okay? Okay. Let's see the clip. That's like really gets you coming to a movie theater. I really appreciate everyone's time. This is a trailer for the film that I think we can play. And it started to play at the beginning and maybe it'll entice you to come. And if anyone, I'd love to have more questions and comments and there will be a panel of myself and actually three remarkable young men who are at the back. Can you guys stand up? Um, I have Frankie Correo, I have James Anderson, and I, and I have Prophet Walker. These are three young men who walked into the room today. I thought they were some of your staffers. It was then described to me that all three of them are former inmates in the system. Shows you can put a suit on anyone and make them look like an upstanding citizen. Or what it really shows is that we far too often underestimate the people in California who are decent people that didn't get a chance. These guys now have a chance. Two of them are at LMU and one of them is at East LA Community College. Remarkable young people and they'll be with me tonight. I got to spend some time with them this morning. Thank you so much for having me and enjoy the clip. America's public enemy number one is drug abuse. What will you do when someone offers you drugs? We intend to end the drug menace and to eliminate this dark, evil enemy within. Put him away. Put him away where they Three belong. Three strikes and you are out. Somebody down the road said drugs are bad. Okay, there's no argument there. But think about where we are 30 years later. I do what I have to do. I know how to survive. Yeah, I got some weed, too. Don't let them run. <laughs> against drugs is heating up. I think they should have wrote prison guard on my forehead when I was born because it just fits me. I say he's a criminal. Let him go to prison. I have a life and 30 year sentence. 20 years for drug trafficking. I have life without parole for three ounces of methamphetamine. Of the 2,600 people I've sent to federal prison, I've seen three or four kingpins. We're incarcerated poor people who are drug addicts. You're watching poor, uneducated people be fed into a machine like meat to make sausage. Law enforcement agencies get rewarded in cash for the sheer numbers of drug arrests. My money's ours now. That's my money now. The scale is unbelievable. Nobody jails their population at the rate that we do. All sorts of people get a financial interest. Taser gun manufacturers, health care providers, phone companies. You build a bed, they fill the bed. And you'll get rich, and we'll get rich, and we'll all be rich together. <laughs> What happens when you take large numbers of people, remove them from their neighborhoods, their families? What y'all getting them for? What does this do to the broader community? The drug war is a holocaust in slow motion. This is a war on all Americans. I think people keep saying, well, that's about them. Well, no, it's about you.